So this is a funny internet meme, and things that are funny are funny because they're true, at least partially. It is illegal, or at least bureaucratically cumbersome. So today I'm doing a case study on Los Angeles, a city that famously got urbanism right at some point in the very distant past, and then spent most of the last century being exhibit A of just about every bad example of auto-oriented development you can think of. What we're going to look at is LA's historic electric railways, the urban fabric that developed around them, and how the city is working to leverage those places with new transit investment. It's all up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome down in the comments, and I do get a lot of requests for, I don't know, top 10 streetcar suburbs or whatever. But I wanted to go straight to the heart of the matter, and that has to be Los Angeles. First though, an apology of sorts. I posed the question, is LA salvageable in the video title? And it's a sort of clickbaity, obviously dumb question since like 13 million people live in greater Los Angeles, and it still has some of the highest housing prices in the country. So obviously the way LA is, is just fine with plenty of people, even at an astronomical price point. Even so, it's hard to argue that the city doesn't have a lot of room for improvement. And really, this is a question about the US. We've made so many mistakes in the last century that it's fair to ask, is it fixable? And I really think looking at the history of the electric streetcar and its long-term impact on urban form is a doorway into that question. Because I spent time in LA recently and it quickly dawned on me that Every single place that felt walkable or was a place I might actually want to hang out, and there were a lot of them, well, they were all legacy streetcar suburbs. So let's start with some history. In 1901, Henry Huntington acquired a bunch of independently operating electric streetcar lines and consolidated them as the Los Angeles Railway. In 1902, Huntington and a partner established the Pacific Electric Railway, which consolidated several other services that were focused on longer distance interurban travel. By the 1920s, the Pacific Electric Railway, also known as the Red Car, was the largest electric railway system on the planet and I think we're just talking about track miles here, which was around 1100, because it turns out the ridership on the Los Angeles Railway, or yellow cars, was higher. Keep in mind, at the outset, these streetcar systems were privately operated, often by the same investors who were behind the residential subdivisions the streetcars were serving, with the idea that the transportation link itself increased the potential sales price of the property or made it feasible to sell at all. So the transportation links were absolutely critical to neighborhood and street design. The districts that developed around streetcar lines at the beginning of the 20th century typically featured a grid with small blocks and commercial or mixed use space directly fronting the sidewalk. So you ended up with walkable main streets that were designed not only to serve the surrounding residential community, but to intercept streetcar users traveling to and from the line. What's amazing to me is we're like 120 years on. All kinds of new transportation technologies have come and gone, but this kind of urban form is really still the gold standard. It's compact, vibrant, walkable. It's got a mix of uses. It engages the street. The story of how Los Angeles went from being a city that was built around electric railways to a city that was built around every individual human driving their own internal combustion engine vehicle wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, is way too big a topic for this video. But it happened, gradually, through the early to mid 20th century. The streetcar networks themselves were dismantled, but they left behind a sort of phantom limb of elegant urban form wherever the streetcar lines existed, and that has persisted even as planning and engineering evolved to preference auto-oriented development through much of the 20th century. So this is the thing, a street system is nearly immutable once it's been laid down. What I mean is cities and neighborhoods that were designed in the automobile era have wide streets, disconnected networks, and huge setbacks in parking lots, and it's very tough to change that. Cities like this have a steep uphill climb to transform their streets into anything more walkable and livable. But here is really the thesis for this whole video. 
The places where streetcar era urban fabric is largely intact are not only the gold standard for urbanism, but even in 2022, they are the places where people do enjoy a high level of amenity in their own neighborhoods. They're the places that are walkable, and they're the places that do have the most housing demand, even in a city as purportedly car-oriented as LA. I mean, look at it. The shopping malls of the late 20th century barely exist anymore. They've either been gutted or raised, but main streets with streetcar era storefronts are more desirable than ever. To be clear, what I'm not saying here is that 1920s era electric rail is a super useful transit service we should be replicating today. They aren't what we think of as high quality rail transit anymore. Having a legible rail network though, organized around corridors and nodes, has huge benefits to efficiency, walkability, and neighborhood design that persists for generations. So I was in LA recently and I wanted to spend some time discovering parts of the city I'd never been to, exploring neighborhoods, and understanding how the electric railways shaped the Los Angeles of today, and what we might be able to learn from it. I'm gonna share lots of footage, but LA is LA and it's not easy to get everywhere you wanna go, so I'll supplement with Google Earth, which is my MO anyway. I'm gonna talk about both the red and the yellow cars today. But let's start by acknowledging that the red cars were largely suburban oriented and went to Orange County as well as San Bernardino and Riverside counties. That's all interesting, but I'm really gonna focus on services within the city of LA or cities that just feel like they should be part of LA, like Glendale, Pasadena, Culver City, and Santa Monica, or close-in suburbs to the east like Whittier. And let's start at the hub of the network, downtown. Yes, LA has a downtown. The yellow cars ran on a more extensive network. Broadway, for example, was an important corridor. The red cars were focused on Hill Street, where they eventually ran underground, converging on the subway terminal building at Hill and Forth. Hill is now the street under which the modern metro system's single downtown trunk line runs, and unfortunately, the street has lost a lot of the streetcar era urban fabric it once had. The frontage is very discontinuous, where commercial buildings were demolished in favor of surface parking lots and parking structures. I mean, Grand Central Market is still intact, and no surprise, it is one of the biggest draws downtown. But let's explore some of the lines that radiated out from downtown where a lot of the urban form still exists. I spent an afternoon walking the defunct Hollywood red car line out from downtown along Sunset Boulevard. A lot of the streetcar era fabric along this line is still intact and you can see it in neighborhoods like Echo Park where you do get a lot of Dodgers murals, but you also have great old Main Street style building stock. Jensen's Recreation Center is a prime example. It dates from 1924 with commercial frontage that's still bustling today. And it was originally designed with a bowling alley and a pool hall on the ground floor as well with two floors of apartments above. One interesting thing about Sunset Boulevard through this area is how topographically constrained it is. You get these kind of picturesque overpasses where the streets below also have a main street feel. And it continues into Silver Lake as you head northwest. This also means public stairways, which you definitely get in cities with challenging topography where you need a direct connections between neighborhoods and the streetcar line and you also get some very precarious looking buildings. Again though, Sunset through Silver Lake is just packed with segments of busy storefronts, some of them legacy, some of them newer infill, and these are just places where people like to hang out. It's LA, the weather is spectacular, what'd you expect? This segment of the Hollywood line is also home to the Olive substation, which supplied power to multiple Pacific Electric lines and is now apparently home to the headquarters of Epitaph Records. The line continues west, transitioning from Sunset to Hollywood, passing through the Los Feliz neighborhood. Let's just take a moment to acknowledge that Hollywood and Sunset are wider than what you want in an urban main street, but the city has added pedestrian crossing locations, and the corridor does continue to attract development. 
I didn't continue walking down Hollywood Boulevard because it's annoying, but if you can see past the people dressed up as mutant ninja turtles and Star Wars characters, the urban form is great, the architecture is actually very cool, and the corridor is now served by the Red Line subway. I did want to hit one of the outer neighborhoods on the yellow car system. This is Larchmont Village, which is at the end of what was the three line. Larchmont is especially good because you'll notice it only has one motor vehicle traveling in each direction. It does have head-in angle parking, which I have mixed feelings about, but man, there is a lot of it that has been transformed into outdoor seating, even places where they repurpose just one stall. I haven't seen this in many cities, so let me know down in the comments where else you've seen this. Also, I know it's 2022, but I do love a neighborhood that's got a functioning newsstand. Let's go out to the ocean. The coastline is integral to LA's identity, and areas like Venice were well served by the red cars. The Inglewood Line ran along Electric Avenue just behind Abbott Kinney Boulevard, and the Venice Short Line ran on Pacific Avenue on its way up to Santa Monica. You can still find the old Venice station where Windward Avenue runs into the beach, and all of this legacy urban form really helps give Venice the character it has today. Up in Santa Monica, the airline ran along Main Street and you'll still find the transfer station from 1917, where you connected between the standard gauge and narrow gauge lines that ran along the coastline. Main Street still has a lot of the great building stock of the streetcar era, and some of it's refurbished, like this blue bottle, which I believe is a Frank Gehry job. Oh, Venice had some Frank Gehry too. I've got more to say about the streetcar legacy and how LA is working to leverage these great old corridors and nodes with new transit investments. But first, brief reminder to drop a like on the video if you're enjoying this bit of time travel. Subscribe and hit the bell if you want to get pinged every Wednesday. And consider joining the Patreon if you want to support further urban expeditions. Sub count check. Man, I've got some extremely bad American NFL stadiums I could have gone with this week, but I don't think I've gone to Germany yet. So let's go to Gelsenkirchen, where we can now fill Velten's Arena, home of FC Schalke. Honestly, most of the Bundesliga stadiums don't excite me that much from an urbanism perspective, but any soccer stadium that has a player entrance tunnel that's done up to look like a fake coal mine is a winner in my book. Quick question before I continue the tour. I could be wrong about this, but I just feel like this channel doesn't have that many LA viewers. I mean, is it that people who self-select living in LA are mostly people who don't really place a high priority on urbanism? I also have a theory that Angelinos just have better recreational and entertainment opportunities than everyone else, so they don't spend that much time watching YouTube. The analytics I get don't give me that granular of geographic information on you all. So if you're an LA-based viewer, leave a comment down below and let me know you're out there. Okay, let's hit some parts of the red car network where rail transit has actually come back from the dead and leveraged some of this great baked-in urbanism. First, let's go back to Santa Monica where the Expo line terminates at 4th and Colorado, right in the heart of the city. Downtown Santa Monica was dense with electric railway lines, including on the 3rd Street Promenade, and the Expo line goes some way to making it feasible to live or visit car-free or car light in this city. North of downtown LA, as you go out on the Gold Line, you run into several neighborhoods that were shaped by the Pacific Electric. The Gold Line through Highland Park runs on Marmion Way, which is extremely funny and has an almost infuriatingly slow speed zone. The old yellow car actually ran on Monte Vista, I believe, but all the action is on Figueroa, where the red car ran until 1956. Continuing north on the Gold Line, you get to South Pasadena Station, where it crosses Mission Street, which is another corridor where the Pacific Electric ran. And then further north, you're in downtown Pasadena. The red car ran on Colorado Boulevard, which is an interesting street. It's really wide, and it is part of the original Route 66 from LA to Chicago. Still though, it is walkable with fun architecture and a lively street scene. Lake Avenue in downtown Pasadena was also part of the red car network, and it's the same thing. Street is maybe a bit too wide, but the urban fabric is lovely. One thing you do have to say about LA Metro's network, 
pretty much every station, no matter where it is on the system, seems to have a park and ride, even downtown Pasadena. What is it Donald Shoup said? Off-street parking requirements are a fertility drug for cars? Seems applicable. Finally, before we leave SoCal, let's hit Culver City, which is a separate municipality, but is pretty much completely landlocked by LA itself. There was a major junction on the Pacific Electric Network where Venice Boulevard and Culver Boulevard came together, and that's still ugly, but the city has done a lot with Culver in recent years. You've got protected bike lanes and dedicated space for buses, street space reclaimed for people walking, great original storefronts and architecture. The old Culver Hotel with the surrounding public space is gorgeous. And you do have the original Ivy substation, which has also been repurposed. This one for the Actors Gang Theater Company. The interesting street design continues as you move north in central Culver City. And eventually we're at the Expo Line station, which HBO apparently paid a handsome sum to sponsor. Now, you can definitely criticize what's going on here. It is all a bit antiseptic and upscale, sure, but aren't Culver City and LA Metro essentially doing the right things? They've reallocated street space for transit and people. They've created public space around the station. There's a bike hub. Is it affordable in any conventional sense? Probably not, but affordability is macro. When you build stuff like this, it relieves price pressure elsewhere in the region. And there's a lot of demand to live in this region. Let's wrap this up. Is LA salvageable? Yeah, sure it is. I'm an optimist. Is LA walkable? Yeah, it's definitely walkable. On certain corridors and at certain nodes, which just happen to coincide with the old electric railway networks. And in those places, I observed what I think is a ton of latent demand for more walkability in LA. It's just, in 2022, the places you'd want to go once you leave your neighborhood are generally very far away and not well connected by transit. Don't worry though, LA is working on it any decade now. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining me today on this time travel tour of walkable LA. Let me know if you're interested in more of this type of video in other cities. Thanks again to all the patrons who really helped defray the cost of travel this month. You folks are much appreciated. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.